All right, beautiful people. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whenever you're viewing this. Um, I want to say that to you. And man, I think we, we're getting to the part of the syllabus, which is a lot more closely tied to my to my research, at least my PhD research. Um, I don't know, this this is the fun part for me, right? I'm getting into stuff that um, the areas that I'm, I'm heavily read um, and have created a lot of a lot of understanding. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, it's just the exciting part for me. So this, this may get a little bit deeper, may parse out into some certain areas and I definitely wanna show the societal impact. I mean, social media is, is a big piece. Media in general is a big piece. It controls a lot of our subconscious and a lot of our conscious thoughts. Um, so it's a reason why I chose to dig into media and it's a reason why I chose to do this for the class today. Um, so we'll jump into the readings in a second here. I also want to note that um, we have a guest lecture on Wednesday. Um, she is, is uh, what, what word do I give her? She's superwoman. Um, a lot of the articles that you're gonna read for Wednesday, she has written. Um, and those are only just a small portion of what she's done. I mean, she's she has a, she has a tremendous CV, curriculum vita or, or a lot of experience within the area. Um, has been president, has professor, like she's she's done a, a whole lot within it um, and currently works at San Jose State. So I, I want as many folks that could be there for that one to be there for that one. That's going to be an excellent one. Um, former student athlete, you know, former Olympian. I mean, she, she's done she's done a whole lot of great stuff. So I want y'all to be able to plug in for that one. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. We're going to go through this PowerPoint. If anybody has any questions, again, I'm available during class time to answer questions, any kind of things that are gonna pop up for you. We're working on grading to be able to get it done. Understand that's like 160 assignments. Um, if you break it into this about 80 a piece per TA, so you can understand how, you know, how, how hard it is to continue to go through a lot of these and get them done. So um, every chance you get, please applaud your TA, even you know through all of this, they're, they're going through the same situation as you are. They're struggling the same way that you are, um, the same workload. I mean, they, they have this class they're teaching as well as their own academic workload too. So um, just sometimes say thank you, you know? Um, it goes a long way, it goes a real long way, okay? Let's jump in. Got it in there. All right. Still rolling here. Okay, 213. Oops, let me do that. Another anthropology 213. So we're gonna talk about media, sport, and racial frames, and crime rhetoric and images. And all these are under the guise of social media and critical discourse analysis. So, but these are the pieces that we're specifically gonna to hit today. And then on Wednesday, Dr. Carter Francique is gonna to touch on some different pieces for you all. So I want to say this first, as I'm in no way condoning domestic violence or saying that these individuals that we're going to talk about um, did not commit the crime accused. Rather, I'm pointing out disparities in terms of treatments of the crime. I think we're going to talk about some pretty sensitive stuff here with domestic violence, rape. Um, and I, I just want you all to know that I am in no way condoning this. I'm not saying that folks should be let off. I'm not saying that they did or did not do it, but what I am saying to you all is that there's a disparity in the way that both, and, and a lot of what I'm gonna show, there's a disparity in it. And I'm pointing to that more so than, um, you know, putting a value judgment on a person or a crime or anything like that. So I want you to take it that way. First off, I mean, class right now, we don't have people to sit around and really discuss with, but we do have, you know, roommates, friends, parents, you know, folks that are around us during this time. So I want you to take two minutes, either before, after, during, whatever it is, just a quick two minutes and discuss with someone one question that you have from the reading. It could be a larger question. It could be about social media. It could be about race. It could be about anything, but I want to spark discussion outside of the class and to see what other people think. I mean, I feel like you're being equipped with different ways of looking at things or ways that you may have known to look at things, adding some language, whatever it may be, but being able to share that beyond folks that are in the class, other students, 
go ahead and talk to someone, friend, family member. If you're by yourself and you got a pet, shoot, talk to your pet. Um, if you're not, I mean, we all have phones. Well, not we all have phones. It's not a, a very fair judgment. Most of us have phones and, and apparatuses to be able to communicate with somebody else. So essentially, that's what I'm asking. Okay. And again, you can do that now whenever. Just feel free to pause the recording. So I'm going to talk about a media framework today called scripting. Um, and it's by Ronald Jackson. Talk about scripting the masculine body. Um, I used it mainly to examine black male collegiate football players and athletes and their experiences. Um, but scripting is essentially to script someone else's body is to actively inscribe it or figuratively place oneself word view, worldview or inscriptions onto another projected text, which often requires dislocating the original text and redefining the newly affected or mirrored text as counterpositional or oppositional. So for example, you see somebody walking down the street with a 49ers jersey on in Seattle. You automatically think things about them, right? You're scripting your assumptions, your worldview, and everything that you could think of just in terms of a 49er fan or somebody that would support the 49ers, and you're scripting that onto them, right? And it's dislocating the original meaning for that person up to what a 49er fan would be, right? Um, so it's creating a counterpositional or oppositional other so that there's this um, juxtaposition between the two. But the prevailing assumption and worldview is going to be those that are part of um, hegemonic society or those that have power to be able to script that worldview onto somebody and for it to stick and to be treated as a such. So when we talk about media, black males, and crime, um, there is a deep history of this, deep, deep history of this, right? Um, we're looking at a young man in, in Greenville, South Carolina. This is early, I think early 1930s, right? And obviously this, this goes way back beyond then, but it, this, this particular gentleman was, um, if I mean, his history correct, he was an athlete in the community, um, somebody who was, you know, beat up for basically looking at a white woman. Um, in the middle, you see a couple of the, the, the young boys from Central Park Five, and on the right, you have Ray Lewis. Um, and there's a book by Khalil Muhammad called The Condemnation of Blackness, and it details the history of race and crime over a large period. And what Muhammad writes, he says, race relations, uh, race relation writers have inscribed criminality onto every aspect of black people's existence, right? Especially we're talking black males. That crime became linked to migration, to education, to politics, to housing, and, and philanthropy. So you can see it spread with a lot of collateral damage just in terms of other areas and criminality and that understanding which is scripted upon the black body. If we're talking about media and social cognition, um, Oliver Jackson, Moses, Moses, and Dangerfield did a study in 2004 um, that examine the extent the individual's memories of photographs and news stories reflect a stereotypical criminal finding, right? Um, and that included the four pieces that you see here. This is what society or the folks that, you know, the scholars were studying in 2004, this is what it represented as criminal, someone who was criminal. So Afrocentric features, we're talking fuller lips, wider nose, a darker skin tone, aggression, criminality, and violence, right? Um, and this is how the conceptualization of criminals come up in any different shape, form, or fashion, except if we're talking white collar crimes, right? We're not talking bank fraud. We're not talking Wells Fargo, billions of dollars. We're talking here robbery, assault, battery, um, you know, stuff like the such. And the, the picture in the bottom right is representative of what somebody would normally draw as um, a criminal following these stereotypes, okay? And you can clearly see, you know, that, that looks like a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of black men that are currently within sporting age, um, you know? So <clears throat> the racial bias within the news reporting is built upon that foundation of folks' understanding of the stereotypical criminal, right? So in that vein, black folks are, are more likely to be depicted as lawbreakers and perpetrators. 
Um, black people are most often shown to be restrained by police. That's in, you know, like being held back by them in handcuffs and especially very poorly dressed. And, you know, black folks are more likely to be shown as guilty versus innocent, especially at the onset, right? You create that understanding of guilty before proven innocent to really justify everything that happened from that point, right? If, if the, the court of public opinion calls somebody guilty, it's easier to punish somebody and punish somebody more harshly and severely and to dislocate that original meaning of humanity and um, citizenship and everything that really should exist for every single person within the United States. It's easy to dislocate that and minimize it to a body that's being thrown in jail and have that cognitive dissonance from having to feel like they're human, right? If you, if you say they're guilty and they've, they've done a heinous crime, it's easier to punish them, right? For example, if somebody, if you know somebody has murdered somebody and it was on purpose, you, you haven't, you, you would have an easier time in saying, you know what, that person deserves life in jail or he deserves cap, corporal punish, or capital punishment, excuse me, not corporal, um, because that person has taken somebody else's life. And that's the similar understanding of racial bias in news reporting that if they're guilty before innocent, it's easier to punish them and it's, you have more cognitive dissonance between you and the person that you're wanting to be punished because of their crime, okay? Um, so as you see at the bottom, Maurice Jones, I'm Maurice Jones, excuse me. Um, gosh, it's forgetting my name now. Youngstown Boys, Ohio State, uh, Maurice Claret. He's, you know, pictured there after, you know, he was caught in Denver on his motorcycle doing, you know, high speeds and had, had guns, right? Um, you see how he's dressed. And this is the picture that they put out, not the one where, you know, they, they first took him in or any other shots. You see, they, they do the mug shots of Lawrence Taylor. And if you know Pac-Man Jones history, he's been arrested a number of different times um, and they've done that with him, right? But in this, you know, they're, they're talking about another instance where he was arrested and kind of putting that up and, and feeding into the further narratives that, you know, he's guilty before even proven innocent, even through, um, you know, showing his, his history of, of law breaking and being a perpetrator. So this was a, a crime, and sorry, pictures came out like this. I tried to transfer them from, um, you know, the original PowerPoint to, to Google, and this is how it happened. Um, to Google Drive, this is how it happened. So um, this was the same crime. These four individuals were um, accused and some were convicted of, or, and, and yeah, you know, some were convicted of, of rape and sexual assault. Um, but even in these, like it was a couple of news portrayals that used these four headshots. Even in these, there's some stark differences. So the first one, many of you may see, is you know who's smiling, right? And this was purposeful. They they took they took pictures. They took these pictures on purpose. Not all of them are from you know the same place. They're from different places. They're cherry picked and put together on purpose. So you notice who's smiling, who and who isn't. I mean, what do you notice about the background? There's a darker background in one, three, and four, and there's a lighter background in two, right? Lighter background. It, it means something, right? You're playing with the colors, right? When you play with the colors, you have a darker background. It's easier for somebody to either blend into the background or to seem bigger or seem more menacing. The darker it gets, the easier it is to um, equate it to criminality, right? Is there a difference in clothing? You've got t-shirts on in one, three, and four, and you've got a collared shirt in two. And in two, normally it's, it's a little more zoomed out and you can see um, probably about to mid breastplate on um, individual number two which will show more of the collared shirt, um, which you know, brings me to my question number of differences. Number four, why are one, three, and four zoomed in, but two is zoomed out? Okay, again, to, to, to create the aura of seeing the face to make them seem a lot bigger than they are, right? If you have a really zoomed in headshot, you're gonna think a person is, is big. You're gonna think a person, you know, is the, and the bigger they are, the darker they are, the more, um, the more that your mind is gonna tie into the stereotypes of big, black, and menacing, right? Or big, dark, and menacing. Um, and we talked about that previously within the criminality slide as some of the, the often stereotypes. Um, question five, you know, why didn't I take all the pictures from the football website instead of one, three, and four, right? And similarly, you have um, Corey Beatty and Brock Turner, okay? And these are the first betrayals after 
both of these gentlemen were um, arrested for rape, uh, rape and sexual assault, I believe. And I mean, the, the first known pictures of both of them, and these are the ones that are posted. And I don't, I don't think much needs to be said. I feel like it's very obvious just in terms of different portrayals of them. But again, like this is this purposeful, this cherry pick, this is done on purpose. A lot of news sources make sure that these are vetted, the photos, the language, everything is vetted before it's put out. So what are these different portrayals saying to you? One is in a tie. Another one, um, you know, Corey Beatty is, is, again, the zoomed in figure. Hair's out. And look at the expressions. Absolutely crazy. Okay. Um, as Jackson says, the black body is consistently scripted as inherently violent, irresponsible, and an angry street urchin, while the white male body is scripted as young, innocent, and, and an immature individual, right? Again, these are some of the first images that come out of both of like both of them. This is after their hearings. And you again you can see Corey Beatty, which is, you know, he's in his full jumpsuit in jail. Um, you know, awaiting everything to happen. And you have um, Brock Turner, who was fully suited out, allowed to kind of stand. You see they cut his hair, right? Um, make him seem a little bit younger. So young, innocent, and immature. Okay, and a lot of times this is a rhetoric that swirls around it too. So when the media reports crimes perpetuated by black males, negative projections are, are revealed in the language of the report. Terms like juvenile and delinquent are common um, reference to young black male assailants. The race of the criminal is always clarified at the beginning of the broadcast or article. In contrast, media reports of white male criminals are neutral or positive in their use of language. And this came out in the Corey Beatty and Brock Turner articles, right? And I know a lot of you are like, well, this is just one example. You know, this is just one time. Don't worry, I got something for you. Um, so within the Corey Beatty article analysis, it talks about the statement of his playing position and you know helping him to signify the race of Mr. Beatty. A lot of times we think of sports positions, you know, you you can also tie that to a race, especially with football. Football is is um, black males are overrepresented in the game of football, American football, and positions such as wide receiver, running back, um, safety, corner, ones that you know take a a good level of skill, right? Not just intelligence, but skill as well. Um, athletic skill at that you see um, you see them talk about those positions being tied more so and represented the numbers of more black folks in those areas and that was specifically stated to try and uh, signify the race of Corey Beatty majority of the stories focus on the victim of the actions versus the facts in the night of that day right if you talk about the victim over and over and over and what has happened you you garner animosity for the perpetrator, no matter if they're guilty, innocent, if you talk about the things that happen in horrific, you know, stuff detailed and from somebody's opinion, not based on fact, you're trying to drudge up an opinion against somebody in the court of public opinion, right? Um, the word alleged was only used when quoting the Vanderbilt University system. So alleged, Vanderbilt had to use the word alleged because it was, it was partly them on the line as well for, you know, them being representatives of the university as football players, right? Um, and it's also a non-neutral stance in describing the four young men as dis as being dismissed for team for or from team actions, right? Lastly, the title of the article is focused on the indictment or rape as a headline. So if you if you take if you read an article that says rape or indicted for rape, right? In the headline, you're gonna think that person is is guilty more so than not, because that's what's being used in it. But let's let's go to the flip side in terms of Brock Turner, right? If we're doing a, a linguistic analysis or a discourse analysis in this, artic the article's about Brock Turner. And again, this was this was my study that I did a while ago. Um, but it, it looked at, I think, let me recall this correctly. It looked at 10 different news sources. And I had over... 120 article hits, and a lot of them were, were repetitive, just taking a story, posting again, taking a story, post it again, for both Corey Beatty and Brock Turner, okay? So the articles either did not specify the race or, or detailed him as quiet, blonde, and a teenager, right? And he's 19 years old. 19 years old, I mean, yeah, teenager, technically. You're a collegiate student at that point, and a lot of times, 19-year-olds, I mean, 19-year-old, you're, you're charged as uh, an adult. 
right? So to cost my teenager at 19, it's really counterproductive in the criminal justice system in, in, this, in this instance, right? But not specifying a race is also signifying that um, Europeans have normal race, right? Or they're, they're the normal, they're the, the middle line, they're the commonplace. Everything else is additional and has to be added on, right? And so when you don't signify race, a lot of times it's to take out the fact of equating Europeans to some of the crimes that they're doing or dislocating it. Um, and also when you search it up again, you have to actually search the person's name versus a race versus a bunch of different things, which creates you know, a, a larger ambiguity for researchers. So it's focused on his stellar academic achievements. And these are articles about him being a rapist. He had raped a young girl behind a trash can. Corey Beatty raped a young woman along with a couple of his teammates. This is how he's being portrayed. This is how Brock Turner is being portrayed, right? Both despicable, but one is necessarily being let off in terms of rhetoric. Um, so when you talk about somebody's stellar athletic achievements as a swimmer at Stanford, which they mentioned over and over and over and over again, Stanford, 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 swimmer, swimmer, swimmer. You talk about somebody's athletic achievements when they rape somebody, you're really missing the point. You're missing the focus of it. But again, what's the purpose? You got to think larger than this. It's not about one article, not, one, not about one instance, not about one thing. This is a larger system. So it used good moral judgment testimonies like, I can tell you nothing but good things. The boy's, the boy's like a son to me. I've never known anything about him that wasn't upstanding, right? You're saying this about somebody who's a perpetrator of rape and witnessed in both cases. Word alleged appeared between four and seven times in most articles when referring to his crime. And this was, those articles were beforehand. So using the word alleged was correct. Um, but if we look at the Brock Turner side, it, it wasn't used. Alleged was only used when talking about Vanderbilt. Um, the articles detailed, detailing Turner talk about absence from school versus being kicked out. My man was kicked out. You're convicted of rape and you know, you're, you're kicked out of Stanford, good brother. But it says absence from school, right? Softer language. Um, the titles of the articles focus on his former athletic status at university and his not guilty plea versus focus on the indictment or, uh, or him as a rapist. Right, so these are just major glaring ways in which they stood out in terms of the rhetoric that they used. So scrutinizing news frame will lead participants to have more blame for the suspect. Scrutinizing news frames would have more negative feelings for the entire racial group of the suspect shown. Okay, and this is what happened to Corey Beatty. Right, because of that cognitive dissonance, because of position the way he was positioned. Um, someone accused of rape of an un, or Corey accused of rape of an unconscious person got 15 to 25 years. Now, Brock Turner got six months and was out in three. I just want that to sit. We're talking about the criminal justice system here, but we're also talking about the people that continue to uphold the system by the way they report it. Okay. Um, and I know everybody saw the I don't I, I guess I shouldn't have said that. There was there was a murder of a young man in Georgia. Um, a 25 year old who was jogging through the neighborhood and a father and son, a vigilante father and son um, decided to follow him because they felt like he looked like a suspect who had stolen something from the neighborhood. Followed him, got in their truck, had their guns, ended up murdering him in cold blood in the street. And only because of press and press from, you know, folks that wanted to see the video were they actually arrested. And arrested is one thing. I'm not going to go down this soapbox, but again, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is not something that just affects one area, right? This is a criminal justice system. This is media, and these are these are sports like folks that are in the sports pipeline. And as we get on later, these are sports stars. So this is something to be said if these folks are treated that kind of way. If I don't want to say the common person, but the folks that don't have the same notoriety, they're not given even the semblance of, of a fair shake that should happen, okay? So when I talk about this is not an isolated issue, this is what I'm talking about here. For example, on the left, we're looking at Richard, Richard Sherman, all pro cornerback, 
never been arrested to knowledge, graduated with a 3.9 GPA from Stanford. Um, and he basically, he called himself the best at his position, at, at what he does professionally. He said, I'm the best. And we're talking about the rant in particular that we watched last week with Aaron Andrews. Not once did he curse, not once did he say anything obscene. He was excited. He just made a great play at the end. And resulting, he's, he's referred to as a thug because he's yelling. Again, the juxtaposition and the optics of that, that video, we're looking at Aaron Andrews, a smaller white woman, and Richard Sherman, a larger black man, um, long hair, and is yelling, right? And he's referred to as a thug. On the other hand, we have uh, Justin Bieber, right? Early on, he's an international pop star, still is. I mean, today, if you listen to his music, yeah. Um, he was caught peeing in a mom bucket, you know, screaming, fuck Bill Clinton. He was arrested for a DUI, resisting arrest. Um, he stood on a balcony and spit on fans. These are just a few of the things that he's done, right? And he's still referred to as a misguided kid. My man ain't no kid. And the juxtaposition of those two, misguided versus somebody being a thug, and they've they've created this understanding and, and went to some of the schools that can be considered, you know, tip top or whatever you want to have it, and excelled. So there's a juxtaposition there, right? Um, Dylan Roof and Dylan Klebold up top. Dylan Roof was uh, murdered nine people in cold blood in a church in South Carolina and was escorted out, taken to Burger King, treated more or less like he turned himself in versus actually just committing a murder. Um, and Dylan Klebold was one of the one of the, the tandem team shooters that were in Columbine um, back in 1999, 2000, um, if I'm not mistaken. And both of these folks in news reports were talked about as being immature, um, not the norm, right? This is out of character for young white boys. Um, innocent, right? They were innocent kids. You know, I couldn't see them doing this thing and they were misguided. And for Dylan Roof in particular, well, you know, he, he has some mental health issues. I will tell you all that at this point, right, racism is not a mental health issue. Racism is a choice, okay? And these two gentlemen made a choice to, to be that way. Well, Dylan Roof did. Dylan Klebold, you know, there's nothing definitive that says he was racist, but he did shoot people up in a school, right? You go into a school with, with automatic weapons and you're killing people for no reason. How are you innocent, misguided, or immature? And that is the norm. We look at school shootings, we look at mass killings. We have a lot more mass killings in this country done by white supremacists, by young white people, by older white people, than any international terrorist, as you could think of. And terrorist is another term which needs to be investigated, right? Think about what a terrorist means and the descriptions behind it. Okay, on the bottom, we talk about those that are called thugs, criminals, violent, drug addicts, right? And this is the norm for their race. Okay, or for their, this is a norm for them. And what Hawes tells you says, um, and you have uh, Eric Garner, and um, I cannot remember the gentleman's name right now off top. Um, she's just gonna bother me. Philando Castile. Um, and you know, a, a, one of the young student athletes from Florida a and he was shot while driving in his car. And you know, the ideology that consists in the ways it means by by which meaning and signification serve to sustain relations and structures of domination. Conversing articulates meaning with experience, which produces consciousness as, an, as embodied subjects. At the same time, it produces history and reproduces sociocultural formations. So the understanding of one group being immature, not the norm, innocent and misguided, with the juxtaposition on the, on the other group saying thug, criminal, violent, drug addict, and that being the norm, has created or reproduced the sociocultural formations that have existed, as we talked about, over 400 years. Right? In the beginning, I talked about this is a long stretch, and this is, this is the most current iteration of these, these systems that are working to perpetuate this understanding. Okay? Does anybody know who Christian Peters is? I'm going to go ahead and say no, unless you're a Giants fan. Um, and back in the 90s, when many of you weren't born, a woman had filed a police report saying 
um, you know, Peter invited her into a room and his company of friends, and then he sexually assaulted her, right? And I know this, this may be graphic to some folks to read these details, and I completely understand if you don't want to, go for it, skip the slide, do what you need to. Um, in 93, it was also another incident, right? And in 94, another woman accused him of grabbing her by the throat, you know, after the booster club. 95, another incident, right? Um, and this gentleman, was, he was in Nebraska at the time, right? So two University of Nebraska play, football players, one white, one black, were charged with assaulting white girlfriends. King and Springwood argued that the white player, Christian Peter, who was convicted um, for his assault, garnered much less media attention than black player Lawrence Phillips, okay? So this is Lawrence Phillips. Lawrence Phillips was accused of assaulting former girlfriend um, in his apartment at 445 a.m. Um, and the Daily Nebraskan learned that the woman was Kate McEwen, and she played on, on the women's basketball team. So these are some of the details, but the, the, the difference is how much media attention Phillips garnered, right? They're both athletes, they're both on the same team, they both committed the same thing, but this happens more so to criminalize uh, Phillips in this instance than it does Christian Peter, right? And I challenge you all, right? This is this is from Zelani 2015, talking about the, the stark differences in between the two. The citation is at the end if you want to go dig further through it. But I challenge you all to look up Christian Peters and Lawrence Phillips. Use JSTOR. Use, use EBSCOHOS. Use a lot of the different library resources that we have to be able to look up articles on these two gentlemen. And you'll see the stark realities. I'm not just making these things up. These things exist. These things have been studied. Um, I, just, I just want you all to understand these pieces. Okay, so domestic abuse in the media, um, as the articles tell us until 1994, news coverage of domestic violence was like sporadic, right? It happened here and there. And then in, I think until the, and even in the 90s, it was still legally, you were still acting legally if you raped your wife, right? Um, because in the eyes of the law was seen as a wife's duty to be able to have sex with or to have sex with um, their husband. So again, just that understanding of patriarchy, that understanding of assault, rape, violence that existed back then towards women um, cut a lot of domestic abuse out of the media, right? So it was sporadic. These were like extreme instances. For example, OJ Simpson, right? So the motivation um, for the relative boom in articles in the 90s was rightly attributed to the, the combination of the 1993 sensationalized case of Lorena Bobbitt, right, um, as she severed her husband's penis, and um, the revelations of O.J. Simpson's abuse of Nicole Brown Simpson. What counts as abuse and is admonished socially, physical assaults, um, and what does not count is emotional control, use of male privilege, financial control, et cetera. Like these are still facets of domestic abuse that exist wholeheartedly out there. And, you know, your neighbors may be dealing with it. Your, your parents may be, your grandparents may be dealing with it. And a lot of it necessarily they think doesn't count, right? It's something you can walk away from, right? Why don't they just walk away, right? Another thing to think about is who's held accountable, Right? The folks that are held accountable for a lot of what counts as domestic abuse and a lot of what does not count sometimes is, you know, men that are racially marked, right? Men of lower so socioeconomic standing, right? So poverty and race are two pieces that are going to affect it. And who isn't? A lot of times white upper class men and high profile men more broadly, right, regardless of race, aren't necessarily being implicated. This is why now you see a big movement for Me Too attacking a lot of the big figures, right? Um, Bill Cosby, you got um, Harvey Weinstein, you know, you got, uh, I forget the name of the, the host, um, uh, Kevin Spacey, you know, or I think it was Kevin Spacey, um, I'm talking about House of Cards, main actor, maybe that's not, I don't know, my wife looks at me funny every time I talk about actors and actresses, because I don't remember names, so the main person that was in um, House of Cards, right, that's why you go after these folks, with the Me Too movement because they're usually escapable and not really held accountable, right? Um, and a lot of folks that are in Congress, you got a lot of folks in Congress that turn, turn up beating their wives, that, you know, 
they got drug charges, DUIs, but it's always pushed under the rug, kind of not said anything about, and they just owe one to whoever was able to bury it, right? Think about scandal a lot when that happens. And House of Cards, right? This, re this reflects continued efforts to deflect attention away from the influence of hegemonic centers of powers and control. And this came from the article, right? They want to keep those, those centers in, in, intact because when you do, you're able to continue the, the efforts of white supremacy, of patriarchy, of um, economic subordination, right? You're able to, to keep those intact and continue that system moving along, which benefits those that are more or less immune to it. So physical and gender differences through media frames, we're talking about news accounts of abusive black athletes and how that narrative um, employs that it's a natural black um, facet of masculinity to be aggressive. Um, and it also effaces deeper cultural connections, right? To patriarchy, hegemonic white masculinity, and making possible rampant gendered violence, right? So if you have the narrative that black athletes are, are violent, and this is just inherently how they are as men, um, you know, it, it instills patriarchy, like men are supposed to be violent. And it also talks about white masculinity being different from that because they're not necessarily accused of and treated as they're aggressive, right? Um, and that, you know, that that piece right there helps a lot of folks elude jail time, helps a lot of folks elude um, social persecution for what's being done. So high profile sports figures um, are acknowledged widely as a likely domestic abuser due to his often black hyper-masculinized hyper form and simultaneously exonerated from complicated and complicating public scrutiny due to his stardom and intense cultural pressures to be aggressive, right? Um, so performances of hypermasculinity involve more than athletes, spectators, and coaches and commentators alike are prone to accept misogynist comments and actions as natural aspects of sports, right? What we call locker room talk, where boys will be boys. So when you have Black athletes that are often hypermasculine or treated as hypermasculine. Um, again, it's it's plugging deeper into this, especially football players, it's plugging deeper into this understanding that masculinity and culture and race are forcing them to be aggressive, um, which is is beneficial to the sport. You know, in football, the more aggressive you are, the harder you hit, the more you do things, the more hard nosed, the tougher you are the more people like what you do. Think about the players of old. You think about um, Ronnie Lott. You think about um, Mean Joe Green. I'm talking old school now. I mean, you you, you think about some of the, the most revered players, the most feared players that ever played the game. And this is, you know, that's the level of aggression we're talking about here, right? Um, and it also makes people more willing to accept misogynist comments and situations that are misogynistic and patriarchal. Boys will be boys is, is it's, it's a lot wrong with that, right? It's just excusing it and really pointing to the immaturity of boys when they perpetrate. And locker room talk is just something that happens because it's a sacred space to where patriarchy, misogyny, and you know, a lot of times racism can be talked about and perpetuated because it's locker room talk. It's supposed to be a sacred space, right? But these spaces are how domestic abuse, domestic abuse, patriarchy, racism continue to persist. So separating athlete abusers from normal men means presumably non-abusive men, the blurring of roles between athlete and man reinforces normalcy of certain exceptional aberrations as those who will abuse women, right? You have to be somebody else that's gonna abuse a woman, right? Other people do it. It's only a certain class of people to do it. Everybody else that's like that, that's not like that class of people, they don't do it. Such images magnify the physical and gender differences through facial expressions and postures and presumably the difference of psychological disposition. Um, the men all seem confident and generally happy and the women in most pictures as we see about domestic abuse um, seem like crestfallen, small, and made to feel like just torn down, right? Um, when we talk about black bodies and rage, Given such assumptions about black athletes, coupled with expectations 
Sport pushes men towards violence against women, and we are left in a naturalized um, conclusion that black men are most likely to respond with physical violence when provoked, thus bringing full circle expectations about neutral um, brutishness of black men. For sports stars, because of the disproportionate number of black, they are often more the man of a million experiences. Um, but, you know, to be on the, on the cover of Sports Illustrated, you know, guilty under them, again, it's just feeding into this narrative, right? Because truth is not about fact. It's about repetition. The more times you see something, the more times it becomes true. If I was to tell you all today that the sky is not blue, the sky is green, and I wasn't the only person. The president told y'all that. He would tell y'all that anyway. The president told y'all that. Your neighbors told you that. Your friends told you that. The news told you that. Um, newspapers, your your social media apps, everything is going to tell you that the sky is green. You're going to shift your orientation to understand that the sky is green. The only reason a lot of people hold on to a different orientation is because they truly believe in what they believe in, or they have people following believing in the same thing. Got a good saying that's happened in our family for a number of years. We don't believe you, you need more people. And that, in this instance, this is what's happening, right? There's more and more people that are behind the understanding that we're, we're showing today, and it continues to push forward versus the, the opposite, right? Because it's stereotypical. So it talks a lot about OJ, you know, um, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about OJ, right? Because OJ, we we know he did that. But I mean, it's so complicated, such a complicated racist, or not race, such a complicated case just in terms of race and a number of different layers of the criminal justice system that makes it such a sociological and anthropological gold mine, um, you know, to be able to study what comes from it. Now, two individuals that would definitely like to dig into is Michael Vick and Big Ben. Um, and Michael Vick just put out his 30 for 30, a two-part series. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, please do. Um, it says a lot. It talks a lot about what we're talking about here, um, but it also perpetuates a lot of what we're talking about here. So for those who don't know, Michael Vick served 21 months in interstate um, correctional facility for dog fighting um, or in, in a correctional facility for interstate dog fighting. Um, he lost all of his endorsements, including at one time being one of the highest paid athletes at Nike. Um, he was publicly <laughs> chastised for his crime up and down. People protested in front of his house, in front of the, um, the Falcon Stadium. A whole lot happened to publicly chastise him for his crime. Um, he lost much of his NFL fortune because of further lawsuits against him. And then he filed for bankruptcy multiple times because folks kept coming after his money after, you know, he filed bankrupt, got a check, folks came after it. Um, on the other end, Ben Roethlisberger, we'll call him Big Ben, is accused of sexual assault multiple times, different, different women. Um, he was also accused of rape. Allegedly coerced eight employees of a place that he was staying not to corroborate victim stories. So he paid people not to say that this is the story. Um, he asked a woman to go to a room to fix his television. And then he grabbed her, put her against the wall, pushed her head or pushed her into the bed and allegedly raped her. And this is something that came out from um, when the alleged victims of the crime. And in 2010, an anonymous college student alleged that Roethlisberger raped her in a bathroom stall at the nightclub. Um, through all of this, he was only suspended four games and retained all of his endorsements. Okay. I understand these are different crimes, but I also understand that the article wanted to talk about criminality and the difference of race and um, rhetoric in between the two, right? So you have their stories that are sitting out in front of you. This is how they picture it, right? Um, you know, Big Ben did a press conference. He was able to dress up, look nice, all that kind of stuff, and he did it in the locker room, right? It, it drudges up feelings of Steelers fans, it drudges up feelings of football, and noting again that he's a big star, right? And how could a big star do this? 
Um, if you see the Sports Illustrated article right there, it put a picture of the victims or a, you know, a dog that could have been a victim of Michael Vick, right? So what, what kind of emotion are you trying to dredge up right there? Um, and, you know, the crazy part about all this, yes, he knew about it, but I, I challenge you to watch the documentary as well as read the stories that, you know, Michael Vick has said himself. Um, it's not as cut and dry as people make it, right? And, you know, when, when Big Ben did receive media attention, you know, it talked about the hotel employee accusing the NFL of QB of assault and how the three of those people right in that picture then started to turn on the victim and really talk about how she's not, um, she's not truthful to denigrate her, um, her as a person as to, to take her story down to a lie and to say that she's not a credible person, right? Um, in the Vic case, that didn't necessarily happen. He was guilty no matter what, all the way through, no matter if he did or did not. Um, and it maintained that way, right? So in the article, the, the analysis categories, um, they use four different ones, um, as you can see here, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And these are how they, they analyze the rhetoric that was happening between um, articles with Vic and articles with Big Ben. So the study results, Fox News presented the most interesting contrast over the course of 118 days. It ran 57 stories on Michael Vick and over 207 days, it ran no stories on Ben Roethlisberger. None, not zero, not a one. Vick averaged a higher incidence per story than Roethlisberger in category three. This is category three. Presumption of innocence. And category one, which is sentencing. On average, representatives of victims were coded for Roethlisberger 50% more times than Vic, right? So <clears throat> Roethlisberger, Roethlisberger's high average in category two, category two was representative of victim is acknowledged. Um, Roethlisberger's higher average in category two offset Vic's high average in category one, which resulted in two having equal percentage of positive or neutral stories. Okay, and that's how it kind of balanced out there. But Vic also averaged slightly more comments per story about his crime than, than did Roethlisberger. Okay, and for ABC, Roethlisberger and Vic received the same average number of mentions per story on their alleged crime, but because Roethlisberger received more mentions in category four, primarily commentators citing his lawyers, he received two times the percentage of favorable or neutral stories as Vic did. Um, and again, two different crimes. One is, one is a crime against multiple women or crimes against multiple women. And then one is a crime that is heinous in that, right? Dog fighting, it, it's inhumane um, to animals. Um, but it's, it's, to me, it's on two different levels, right? A person and a dog, they're, they're different. You know, Peter might, might argue with me, but I feel like a person and a dog are different. Um, and you, you see the results of the study and it was treated more harshly um, than Vic's, Vic's crimes were treated more harshly than Big Ben's. Okay, CBS uh, Roethlisberger averaged higher scores in category one in every category except one and five but the two players exhibited comparable percentages of favorable and neutral stories. Um, Vic received his highest average rating of scores in favorable categories. He also received high, his highest average scores in unfavorable categories. So how does it play a role in um, racial status quo? Two ways. It's a prominent place for contentious conversation across demographics, especially geography. You can talk to somebody across the world about the incidents in the moment, real time, and it's a lot of conversation that can be dredged up from it. Hashtags, different, um, different message threads you can talk through. And the craziest part about this and maintaining a racial status quo is it can be done anonymously. How many times we're on Twitter do we see somebody arguing that has an egg? Or, you know, on Facebook and we know that bots exist. Um, you know, it's done anonymously because people want to share their real thoughts without impacting their real life or the way that they have it set up. As it regards dialogue centered on sports and held on social media, held on social media, um, conversation is particularly contentious as it relates to what athletes should be permitted to say or to address in regards to matters with racial issues when racial issues intersect with sports. Historically, 
athletes have engaged in activism or tackled controversial issues. Um, they face backlash, scrutiny, and even penalization from their organizations. As Kaufman and Wolf are going to tell us from 2010 um, about social media, when the personal becomes political in sports, the cheerleading often comes to a halt. Right? If athletes use their status and recognition to promote social and political causes, they often find themselves criticized and pushed to the sidelines. I mean, this is the case with Richard Sherman. This is the case with Colin Kaepernick. This is the case with Muhammad Ali. This is the case with Lou Alcindor. This is the case with a lot of athletes over time, right? If they're, they're starting to bring up the political aspects, which again, are not separate from sport, you know, they're, they're often told to shut up and dribble like they told LeBron, right? Um, but it's okay for political pundits to talk about sports and what those athletes are doing wrong. So it's just, it's just a messed up dynamic, right? It's something that, that folks are doing it because of the folks that are speaking out within the sport realm and the platform that they have. So on social media, after beating the Patriots 24 to 23, Richard Sherman um, was talking to Tom Brady, asking, you know, the famous quote, you mad, bro. Right. And this is because he had told um, Earl Thomas and I'm sorry, I pause for a second. Earl Thomas and Richard Sherman, um, this, he is Tom Brady, had told him that he was going to see him after the game when they win. Um, and that's why, you know, Richard Sherman ran over after because it was it was some John at the Mount right between both of them. They said, you know what, I'll see you at the game when it ends and we won. Right. So Richard Sherman went to return the favor, said, hey. You mad, bro? And that's after finding out that, you know, all of this stuff was happening after the game, they won, just to gloat a little because they were talking stuff in the beginning. So the significance, um, Richard Sherman said, I think some people, I think people somehow get a skewed view of Tom Brady, that he's just clean cut, he does everything right and never says a bad word to anyone. We know him to be otherwise. I mean, think about deflate gate. What kind of man has deflated balls and cheats and it's still considered clean cut, does everything right, never says a bad word to anyone. That man is Tom Brady. He's the image of the NFL. He's a six time Super Bowl champion, right? So Brady is often lauded for his intelligence, right? At one point, he, folks are saying he's too smart. His leadership capabilities, his, his, uh, his calm demeanor, and his on field effectiveness. And I put sounds for me at the bottom because I mean, think about it. Think about the stereotypes about white athletes. Think about why they're heralded and lauded. These are the reasons. And I'm not saying that Brady isn't intelligent. I'm not saying he doesn't have leadership capabilities. I'm not saying he doesn't call Demeter and that he doesn't have on-field effectiveness. But what I am saying is that he can also be a goon. He can also be somebody that cheats. He can also be somebody that talks stuff. He, he is human, right? But we choose not to represent that part of it because it's good for the NFL brand. It's good for him. It's good for any, from any PR stance, this is all positive for him. These assertions about Brady's calm demeanor sharply contrast with not only Sherman's observations, but also those of former Patriots teammates like Senator Dan Coppin, Dale Revis, both of whom have suggested Brady is a fiery, relentless taunter, right? You ever had that one friend that, man, they just get under your skin. They just talk stuff, right? If you look at the picture at the bottom left, that was from the Super Bowl. And Brady was talking shit the entire time. Right. And you could see it. They, they would cut the camera angles a lot early because they would just be jawing back and forth. And that's how, you know, that, that's what they want to cut out. That's what they don't want to see. They don't want to see Tom Brady doing that because what does sportsmanship mean in those instances? And you see at the bottom, this is him trolling, right? Hey, Julian, how about that little, how about a little less flex and a little more blocking next time? Right. Very playful, something he put out on his own, but Again, this is just suggested that he's a, he's a taunter. He's a troller. One of the most interesting social media exchanges, I would say, is that between Crabtree and, um, and Richard Sherman, right? And 2014 said, film don't lie. Look at NFL Network, ESPN. Pull up the tape of the game and show me where this guy is the best, right? And this is what Crabtree said to Sherman. Um, and Sherman responded. He said, a lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of sheep. Right, this, this back and forth banter. And both, both of these gentlemen are, are amazing at what they do, right? 
Um, you know, I still continue to compete on a high level, at least with Richard Sherman. You know, I was just in the Super Bowl. Michael Crabtree, I haven't heard from him in a little bit, but it's okay. Um, but these tweets got over 70, 72,000 retweets and was liked over 46,000 times. Right? All because they were just going back and forth. And people understand that conscientiousness, that not, not conscientious, contentiousness, and, you know, going back and forth with each other in, in the name of sports. While many others expressed shock or mild disdain for Sherman's comments or playfully mocked Sherman, many also featured racial slurs such as coon, nigger, which was most frequently used, and porch monkey and other disparaging remarks, um, such as calling for Sherman to be lynched. Again, we're talking about social media. Something's supposed to be light, flary, and we're talking about sports. Something, again, is supposed to be light and flary, but this is the point that a lot of folks tend to miss. Those areas don't have definitive lines. Everything is intermixed. You don't, sports don't operate in a vacuum. Social media doesn't operate in a vacuum. You can't be in one space and not have the other influence it. And this is how it pops up. If we're, re, we're, we're digging up the 400 year history of black folks in America, right? We're gonna see a lot of that rear its ugly head now and has reared its ugly head since all of this and is going to continue to rear its ugly head until people realize that there's an issue with this, there's an issue with the system, there's an issue with the understanding. And not only there's an issue, but let's do something to rearrange it. Okay, as Eddie Kaplan wrote, and I'm gonna read these if, if this is, you know, too much for anybody, I think it's, it's about high tide we changed a lot of it, okay? He writes, fuck you, at Richard Sherman underscore 25, you fucking monkey. Can't wait till Peyton roast you next week. And we understand what happened in that Super Bowl. So I bet Eddie, Eddie was pretty goddamn mad, right? To call somebody a monkey, it's, it's represented a porch monkey, which is a racial epithet towards black folks. Brian Jackson writes, if the fucking porch monkey wasn't lucky enough to be in the NFL, he would be 100% in jail right now. Mind you, again, we read about Richard Sherman's um, accolades in the community, academically and athletically, none of which suggests that he, he would be in jail. But Brian Jackson is building on a stereotype, right? An understanding of black folks. And Brian Jackson probably takes that consciously and unconsciously with him into his workplace, into the things he does, into the interaction he has in the world. Right. Lastly, Jay Tips writes, I hate Richard Sherman, man. I don't care where he went to school. He's a fucking nigger. This shit right here is show stopping to me. Right. This is something that what people think about athletes they've never met in their life, never once in their life, are creating this opinion and, and reifying this history of, of racial caste system, of racism, of, of a number of different ways to denigrate people. Not only citizenship status, but we could talk about humanity in general, right? To strip somebody's complete humanity from them in a system. These are what they're doing. Steve Fleischman said, Richard Sherman just proved you can take a nigger out the hood, but you can't take a nigger out the nigger. Come on, man. Come on, man. Nick Vinzi said, I take that back. Sherman should get lynched. This is just from a game. Playing football, this, this is from a game, and this is our social media tree soon. All right, and last one, Kalia Carpenter. She writes, I know what we do on the farm when a male can't control his rage. Lucky I'm not there. Sherman, act like an animal, get treated like one. And if you don't know what that is, it, it's how they castrate bulls. It's the tools they use to cut their, their testicles off. Okay? And she says, lucky I'm not there. I mean, what, what, like, what, what, what were you going to do to Richard Sherman if you're sitting in his face? Absolutely nothing. But again, social media gives that distance. It allows you to, at least none of them were like bots or supposedly, right? I know Kalia Carpenter got in trouble for her, not in trouble, but she got chastised for her comments and people supported her still after being chastised, right? But the reason this all is, is such... It makes my blood boil. The reason it really means something to me is because this is what it used to be. We talk about lynching here. We talk about castration. This is the history behind it. The bottom left, you see somebody, a, a young black male was lynched and burned on a tree. And if you see in the back, is people in there, like in, in most of the pictures where you can see people, this was a spectacle where people pulled up in their Sunday best 
to watch people be hung. This is, this is the humanity that is lacking. This is, is where we as society do not want to go back to, but we are dragging, we're, we're dredging it up in different ways. We're figuring out ways. I shouldn't have said go back to. This is not the society we want to continue to perpetuate. The bottom picture there you see again. You know, you, you see two. This shit rough. You see two two young black brothers being strung up to trees. And this is all for looking at white women. Just looking. Nothing else. Eyes glanced up and bam, it was a reason. It was a reason to take their life. You see two young, young children, two young little girls, and a young man in, in the picture in the middle under where it says media. Again, these are people hanging lifeless from trees. And these are pictures being taken to document this. And on the right, you see a young, a young boy was not only hung, but he was castrated. I bring you back to these comments. This is the power of social media. This is the power of thought. This is the power and the, the sad iteration of, of power and privilege that are playing out within this today and back in the day. This is where all this leads. This is what they're calling for. They want Richard Sherman to be lynched and for what? They want him to be castrated and for what? But this is what comes from it. This persistent negative view is largely due to sports media, sports media's overemphasis on crimes of black athletes than those of their white counterparts. And that's what Coogan tells us. Richard Sherman says, race plays a major part in how my behavior was, was received, but I think it went beyond that. Would the reaction have been the same if I was clean cut without the dreadlocks? Maybe if I looked more acceptable in conservative circles, my rent would have been understood as passion. These prejudices still play a factor in our views because it's human nature to quickly stereotype and label someone. We all have that. Cunningham tells us that Richard Sherman's willingness and ability to contest those who deemed him a thug constantly does not, rep does not represent the first time in which the NFL players have been willing to speak out about social issues through social media. As Richard Sherman did a lot of responding to folks um, and tried to, try to basically tell them like, where are you getting this from? That makes no sense. Your arguments are, are just based off of racist logic. So former Pittsburgh citizen and Arizona Cardinals running back Rashad Mendenhall tweeted criticism of Americans who celebrated after the announcement of Osama bin Laden, right? And he was chastised to it. But this is a social issue that he decided to bring up because, okay, yeah, to take a, take a life for another life. I mean, that's not necessarily the, the ways that we want to do it. And if we know, if, if we know the history of 9-11, Osama bin Laden um, was supposedly a big piece of that. But, you know, there's still folks, and J. Cole talks about it in, in one of his songs, I can't remember. I think it's uh, High for Hours, if I'm not mistaken, where he talks about, you know, the flipping of power. You know, once you flip power, somebody who, who didn't have it, who has it before, is trying to keep those that had it before down, right? And, or take an eye for an eye, essentially. And that's what's happening with, uh, what Rashad Mendenhall was pointing criticism towards. Okay, NFL players, um, NFL players Twitter users to comment on um, George Zimmerman verdict from 2013. You see a lot of folks that are still talking about police brutality. LeBron just did it the other day for a mod, right? And this was a 25 year old young man who was jogging through uh, a middle class suburb, right? Um, and you see it especially with the removing of Confederate monuments and flags. You know, when that was a big push for that, you had a lot of folks that were speaking out on social media for that. Okay, that brings it to the end. Um, I noticed this was a lot to give you all today. I want you to reach out should you have any questions, concerns, or comments. And I think this not only is it important for, um, you know, us to talk about as a class and in terms of discourse analysis, but I think that Anybody wanting to go down further down this road in terms of research, anybody wanting to examine this further, anybody not understanding, anybody just want to like disagree with what I'm saying. I'm all for it. Just talk to me. Let's talk it out. Um, 
I'm there. Office hours if you need me. Going back to the beginning, just to run back through. Just going to stop share now. So I will see you all on Wednesday. Like I said, I'm here for any questions, concerns, or comments. And Dr. Carter Francis is going to break it down for you. It's going to be amazing. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that will be the end. I'm signing off and look forward to the next lecture.